Hi, I'm Kevin Billingsley. I'd like to welcome you to the first ever streaming event sponsored by Performance Audio, Middle Atlantic Products, and ProTech Marketing. So today we're going to talk about UPS uninterruptible power supplies and the methodology we would like you to use or consider for how to pick the proper one. So let me do a little bit of an introduction about UPS. All of us have probably seen UPS or heard of a UPS. I guarantee that almost all of us have been someplace where the power has gone out. It could be at home, simple as home, or it could be watching the Super Bowl when the power went out. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was good fun. Uh, but you know, the thing about it is, is it interrupts the experience. That's one aspect of it. So like say at home, you're, you know, you're wanting to use the internet and the power goes out. It's kind of like, oh, what a bummer. I'm not able to surf the web anymore. On a commercial application, it could be slightly worse. It could you know, interrupt an important meeting or a meeting of the, you know, imagine the board is in their boardroom and the power goes out. It could be a rather poor experience. But perhaps even worse than that would be the damage to the equipment. So you've got this rack full of many thousands of dollars worth of equipment. There is interruptions in the power and things could be you know, sagging or coming back up and down. And a lot of the equipment we use today, in fact, the vast majority of it is digital. And digital equipment tends to not like to be flipped on and off or have power interrupted without sort of a shutdown or a sequence or an order to that. So that's why it's really important in those critical cases, or in cases where you just don't want an interruption at all, to have a, something that'll back up the power. So how in the past have people gone about picking out a UPS? Now, I do a lot of these trainings and I travel all over the western United States from Texas into, even into Alaska and Hawaii. And so I ask people, because I talk about this, I'm like, what, how do you pick out a UPS? And I think last time when I was here, I even asked some of you, how do you pick out a UPS? Some people have a methodology about it. They kind of look at the box or go to the manufacturer's website and it's like, oh, it kind of looks like it has enough wattage for what I want to pick. That's actually pretty sophisticated to some of the things I've heard. I've heard of deployments uh, even of 400 UPS units in a, it was a, in a, in a school district. And I was told that the, how they picked out their UPS was it fit into the rack. And then as they kept going forward, now they've been, you know, they were purchasing these things for like five year period. So I said, well, <clears throat> After you later changed the rack and it was bigger, why did you keep buying the same UPS? And I was told, because that's what we've always bought. So surely, there has to be a more scientific methodology or a best practice that could be employed to pick out a UPS than those. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So the first thing that we really wanna talk about is what should we back up? And you'll see that we've sort of laid this out into five easy steps here. So number one, without further delay, what to back up. So the first thing you really want to consider when what to back up is what happens when power is lost. So if it's just an experience at home and you're like, man, I don't want to deal with the UPS or anything, that might be okay. It might be okay that the internet goes out, that the TiVo or the Apple TV goes out for a couple of hours. The family may survive. Uh-uh. They may not, you are absolutely right. They may not. In my house with the grandkids over, that could be disastrous. And in a commercial application, in some cases, the experience could be disastrous. So we have to consider that. What's, this, what's the impact of a sudden power failure? Is it, you know, the entertainment goes away? Okay, maybe we can live with that, maybe we can't. Or is it catastrophic equipment failure? That's not acceptable. How long, if the power is interrupted, how long is the disruption going to be and how long can we tolerate that? Is it zero? Is it one minute, five minutes, two hours? So the real thing is we've got to consider the value of the experience that's lost when power goes out and then the back end, you know, whatever the equipment and things that are uh, associated with that. So when we're talking about components, what are some components here that you might think are very, very sensitive to quick power surges off or on, off or on, off or on. Right here, control system devices, the worst. 
they're really, they don't like being jerked on and off. They uh, are known to lock up, or it could even uh, damage or affect circuit boards, internal working. So you can read through this list of things here and see some of the components that you may want to consider when you're doing an installation or considering things that, excuse me, that may uh, need to be backed up. So a computer is really a decision that you have to make either on a personal level or you have to make with your customer. Computers may or may not be critical. If a computer is tied into a control system, it most definitely may need to be backed up. Or it may, and, and, and again, we have to consider what does it need to do? Well, it needs to be able to, let's say, turn off the system or turn off that control system that we said we were concerned about not you know, dropping power real suddenly. So. And if you talk to your customer about that and start asking them these questions, one of the things you'll find is rather than them feeling like you're like, oh my gosh, why is this person asking me so many questions? I just told them I wanted a UPS. They'll actually begin to think like you care about their system, like you're concerned about what's actually happening in their facility or their, or their, uh, or in their project. So the next thing we really want to consider is how much power do we need? Now, like I said, one of the ways that you know, I've heard that people go about doing this is you just kind of look at the thing. You, you know, maybe you're backing up a router. You kind of look at it and you go, yeah, I don't know. It's, this thing is 150 watts. That says, I don't know, 100 watts. This box says it does 500 watts. That should be good. That's a methodology that I've seen used. Or the box looks real pretty and it, it's good, cool. It looks like it's got a lot of lights and buttons and looks neat. That would be another hey, way that I've seen. It's work. Hey, there you go. If it looks good, it must work. <coughs> but believe it or not, there is a better actual scientific methodology that you can use to figure out how much power you're going to need. So. There's a number of different ways you can calculate that. Um, Middle Atlantic on our website does provide a calculator. So if you're like me and you don't want to sit there and pull out your, you know, your, your calculator or a, a, you know, a piece of graph paper and start writing down equations, uh, which you're certainly welcome to do. Some of you might find that entertaining. Uh, I don't. I prefer to go to our calculator. Our, our calculator online will do all of these various methodologies. So the, the, the ways you can do it is the VA method, and you'll see when you look at a UPS, a lot of times you'll see it'll, it'll have a VA rating on it, and that's voltage times amperage. Uh, wattage is the most common way that you do it. So every single, you know, by law, according to UL, if it's UL approved, it's going to have a power rating on the power supply or on the box somewhere. So if you were gonna do it manually, you would just add up all those numbers, and that will give you a total wattage, or again, what did I say we'd use? Our calculator online. So when you go to the UPS section of our website, you'll see the calculator and you can put in any of these. So we'll choose a UPS with a slightly greater VA or wattage rating than what we want to use. Now, if we're using the method I said, which is use the calculator, the, what'll happen is when you put that calculation in, it will drop down and show you all of the UPS units and or backup battery that you may use, and it'll give you some alternatives. So all the various models that you might want to use in that particular application. So we try and make it super, super easy for you. This is really, really important. Remember I was telling you about the methodologies that people use to pick these? Well, guess what happens if you guessed wrong or you picked the wrong pretty box? If your total VA or total wattage exceeds the, the capability of the unit, a lot of people think that what happens is the thing just kind of backs it up real quick for a second or two and then shuts off. Essentially, it just doesn't work. It'll overload the unit and then it just doesn't do anything. Yes? So you're talking about when it has a failure that it does that or it just be because you plug it all in, it's, it's over. Yeah, yeah, if it has a failure. Yeah, if you plug it all in, it, it, it doesn't really care. It's just essentially a, a PDU. It's just a power distribution unit at that particular point. But when it switches over, so it's like when it's it, a failure. it goes in, when it has a failure and it says, okay, I'm kicking on now, then yeah, you don't have a, you don't have a backup. So you lose power. Yeah, now obviously that, that's, that, that, that's kind of a, there's two ways that you can answer that question. One is if you have a power failure and it flips over and you've exceeded that wattage, then yeah, the unit's just not gonna work. 
But if it's an online version, which we're going to talk about in a second, what that is, it won't work at the beginning because you'll, you're constantly running on the battery. So if you overload it at the beginning, then you, you can't even supply that wattage. Yeah. So this may sound simple, but we're going to jump to the next thing of how long is that going to run. So we figured out how much power we need, now we need to know how long it's going to run. A larger load will deplete batteries faster. I know that sounds dumb and it sounds really simple, but again, we're, this isn't something that people always think about. They just, like I said, they look at the box or they look at the, the specs and just go, oh, okay, well, I've got 500 watts, the thing says it's got 500 watts, I guess I'm good to go. <laughs> a smaller load will have a longer run time. So we're going to get into that uh, just a little bit and explain that a little bit more in depth. So to extend the run time for a given load, we either have to special, specify a larger VA, uh, UPS, which that's the most expensive thing that you can uh, basically do. So you, you could end up in a situation here where you're overbuying. So let's say that we really only have a modem and a router but I'm buying this big, you know, 2200 KVA, you know, whatever backup. I mean, it's like, it's wow, overkill. what a waste of money, way overkill, overkill. And, and lots of bucks. So why do that? Uh, you can go to expansion battery packs. So again, if you're looking for more time, that's actually fairly cost effective. Uh, the other methodology, which again, you don't hear people talk about too much is load shedding. So load shedding is basically where you can, if we have this unit here and it has, let's take a look at something here. Let's just use it, look at this and it has two, two outlets. And I say, okay, well, we know that we don't want just a hard shut off, but one of these could go away if it was turned off appropriately. So what I would say is I, in, in the setup of the UPS, I tell it when the battery gets to 50%, 25, whatever you determine, go ahead and turn this outlet off because I'll be able to live without my Crestron controller, but in our office, the internet must keep running. So I'll leave that one on the, on the rest, the remainder of the 50%. That's actually the most cost effective way of going about uh, saving money on battery packs. So you can see that expansion batteries, you, you, I don't know if any of you ever seen a rack in like a server room for like Hollywood. I mean, it'll be a room this big and it, with a UP, and there's stacks and stacks and stacks of battery battery packs. That's because somebody in that particular application uh, has determined that everything that's hooked up there is critical and can't fail. <laughs> Remember the Super Bowl? And somebody didn't said that didn't work out. So I don't know what the scenario was there, but again, before any generators or anything you know could kick on, there really was no there was no time period where batteries came in or any kind of battery backup came in. And, and just sort of a quick sidebar, I met some, uh, a, an integrator that actually did the Academy Awards or does the Academy Awards every single year. And they roll in a big truck and it's full of big, huge battery backup things. And I was like, wow, that sounds crazy. And he says, well, imagine it's the Academy Awards. He goes, how long do you think that can go down? It, it can't. So it must, the show must go on. I mean, it really has to keep going. So that's why I said at the beginning, we were talking about mission critical versus non-mission critical, and then you have to have that conversation with the, uh, the client. So this is a really, really important thing to consider. And when, we, when I was talking at the very beginning, I was talking about the, the ways that people go about choosing UPS. I hardly ever, I mean, it's extremely rare that this ever comes up in a conversation, or do I hear a customer or an end user ask me or discuss or even inquire about how, how fast is the, the conversion from power going out to running on the battery. So there's two different ways that these UPS units work from when power interrupts to when you're going uh, onto battery. The least expensive and most common is something called line interactive. And if you look at this drawing, You'll see that the way that this works is here's your power coming in and it is not running on the battery. Most of the time, it's just going straight through this, uh, this boost buck device uh, to keep the, the voltage stable and then it goes to your, your plugs on the back. And then when the power is interrupted, you see there's a transfer switch there and it shifts everything down to the battery. So when we talk about transfer time, 
we're talking about how fast does that transfer switch, how fast does that happen? And that can be really, really important. Because if it's too long, even though we've said my Crestron, my QSC controller, whatever it is we've got in here is mission critical, and we're protecting this thing, if the, the transfer time is too long, it doesn't matter, it shuts down anyways. So we have to make sure we get the transfer time correct and understand what the various components need. Now, <clears throat> if you ever have a question or you're not sure or you can't get the data in a mission critical sort of application from the manufacturer, err on the side of quicker. It costs more money, but err on the side of quicker. Because some of these are very slow. Uh, we tend to, all the things we tend to do tend to be pretty quick, but there are some very slow transfer times out there. What would you consider slow? 10 milliseconds, 12 milliseconds, that's getting pretty slow. The slowest thing we have is eight. But yeah, you get into 10, 12 milliseconds, even eight's fairly slow. But again, for a modem or a router, it's fine. So it just depends. It's so funny how that's our slow, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <"Why?" laughs> Uh, eight milliseconds doesn't sound like much, but if you ever uh, seen a video where the lips are out with the sound yeah, by eight yeah, milliseconds, yeah. Dude, that <laughs> looks like a, it looks like a Japanese movie from like you know thirty years ago. Yeah. It's really funny. And then the subtitles come like five minutes later. You're like, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so the thing with these is um, the battery. It only runs on battery when power's lost. And then, like I said, there's that transfer time that you have to uh, to deal with. And then there's another more expensive and better version called online. This is called double uh, conversion, basically because everything ends up running on, on DC. So in this scenario, you're always running on the battery. You would only really use this uh, if you were in a situation where your customer was saying, this is you getting fired off this project or you getting fired from your job. This absolutely 100% never can fail. We don't care, I don't care about your transfer time conversation, I don't care about it. This cannot fail. So here we take no risks, we don't worry about how fast something needs a transfer time, how sensitive it is to, to delays and things from uh, line voltage to battery that's always running on battery. Downside here is this runs through batteries quicker. So you'll be replacing batteries on this every two or three years. Uh, because it essentially functions very much like an electric car. Okay. This is a little bit different here. So cleanest power that you can get though because your, all of your equipment is essentially running on nice DC voltage. And then last but not least, waveform type. And again, this is something that I rarely hear discussed, but if you're going down to Best Buy, you have Best Buy here, right? Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, so we go over to Best Buy, and I'm walking through the aisle, and I see, ah, UPS, yes, I need one. And I'm grab about $69, exactly. I grab that, that looks like just what I need. That'll work. That'll work, the picture looks good, it says it has 600 watts, I should be set. So we've kind of, skipped about 90% of everything I've just talked about. And it probably does a square wave. So a square wave, this blue line represents what a normal pure sine wave for power looks like as it comes out of a, if it were coming out of a wall or out of the back of a, the online unit that we talked about. A square wave is obviously simulated and you can see the power supply is very rough when it makes the transition above and below time. So you'll see that that is very hard on most power supplies. And again, it's, you know, we have to talk to our customer, ask what the application is. For a, uh, let's say, a, a laptop, probably, honestly, a wall work doesn't care about a square wave. Most of them don't. So a router, a, a, a cheap switch, you know, those $19 TrendNet switches from Best Buy or whatever, it's not gonna care about a square wave. So, I mean, there are applications that, where it's perfectly fine. We do, not, we do not make anything with a square wave because we don't really go down into $69 and $79 units because we don't want to take that, really take that chance. Your other sort of um, wave that you can talk about is a simulated sine wave. So again, it's a little less expensive than a pure sine wave, but it's stepped. You see the orange 
steps, most components are going to be fine with a simulated sine wave. And then your best units will do a pure sine wave, which is if everything's coming out of the wall properly and you're having no problems with the power company, you would have a pure sine wave. Out of the online UPS that I showed you, you would have a pure sine wave because the unit is going to just generate a pure sine wave. So again, you'd have to look at the components. Again, we're back to, I keep repeating myself, we're back to the conversation with the customer, trying to figure out what they've got to hook up, their wattage, how long they need to run. Now we need to know how sensitive are those things to the waveform that is actually going to be coming out of the UPS. I would say out of all the things that I've talked about here, that is probably the one that least gets discussed. But if you just move right into whatever, I'm a sales guy, so what's easy is to go to the least expensive thing that kind of fits their, fits their needs. And that $69 thing, yeah, it's cool. I walk over, I pick it up, take it home. If I never have a power interruption, it works great. Maybe I put my laptop into it, it's great, so it's fine. Other things that are more critical, that's probably not the way to go about it. <clears throat> so you hear, see, here's a little bit better demonstration of the simulated sine wave versus the uh, pure sine wave. And then the pure sine wave, which is really what, I mean, in a perfect world, cost no object, we would always strive for a perfect sine wave. So in terms of what Middle Atlantic does for UPS, we essentially do three series of UPS units. We talked about online, that's the very top of the line. We introduced that last year at Infocom. So we know what that's uh, all about. Premium is the line interactive, but with a pure sine wave. And then over here we have a select series, which is, again, for less critical components, and it uses a simulated sine wave. And again, within these, uh, these various categories or these various models, um, there are options as well. So it's not just, you know, one, two, three. There's a lot of different varieties of uh, different things you can do there. But this is on the website as well. So it's kind of cool because it gives you, uh, between the select, the premium, and the online, it really gives you a quick overview of all the things kind of that we just talked about. What kind of sine wave does it have? Remember we started off with capacity. We talked about, you know, we might need to know how many outlets. We talked about transfer time. So again, we, we can see it's zero, four milliseconds. Hardly anything gonna have a problem with four milliseconds. But if I knew it was like a stadium, and I said, oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe four milliseconds is too long, or we don't know, the whole broadcast booth's gonna, you know, crash and burn, maybe, with four milliseconds, and we might want to go to online. I don't know if, again, you'd have to look at the equipment that's going in there. And then eight milliseconds so, uh, is here. So it's interesting because you think the Select Series, it's very affordable, and there's a very, very popular restaurant chain. Uh, it's one of those uh, brew pub type of chains. Um, they're using Select Series to back up all the, this, the critical stuff in their rack. So again, they, they did their homework found out what, would, what they need to back up, what was critical, and, and determined that in our, in our offering, the least expensive solution will actually work just fine. So here's really the difference uh, between what we're doing with UPS and what some other um, people might be doing. I'm not, I don't want to sit there and read through all of these, but there's a couple of things I think that are really important for you guys. One is our mount for mounting UPSs into a rack is the most flexible and it's probably the easiest of anything that's in the industry. So even on a big, giant online UPS, which is very, very heavy, because of the way we do the rack rails and make it so that it just pit one person could it, drop it in and slide it in. Almost every other manufacturer, it's a two-person job. You have to have one on each side and then slide it onto the rack and then put it in that way. We do have some small form factors, so one RU, if you're putting it into a rack, is a very small form factor, so we have a lot of uh, different um, ways that you can get things into pretty tight spaces. Hot swappable batteries is a big selling point, so, which means that <coughs> while the unit's running, again, not, in a, okay, not, not when it's running on battery, but when it's running on line power, you can replace the battery for the customer. So when the, the battery, when somebody uh, looks on there and says, oh, the battery needs to be swapped, the thing can be on. You can open the front panels, pull out the battery, and put another battery in. Not everybody does that. 
So that's really important because if you're saying, well, hey, it's battery swapping time, we're going to shut your system down for 15, <laughs> 20 minutes while I uh, swap work. the batteries, um, that may not go over so well. So. You wouldn't have a job anymore. Well, you, you might not. And the bad part is um, you wouldn't want to tell them like you know after the fact, like, hey, thanks for your final payment and everything's all buttoned up. And if you ever need to swap the batteries, let me know. We'll have shut some technicians system. come over and shut down your system. and. Um, but you signed a lifetime contract. <laughs> yeah. uh, the other thing that we do, which I'm very proud of, is, is replace and recycle your UPS batteries. So you can see these four steps. We try to make this as simple as possible for your customer. So if you want and it's time to replace a battery, you guys can place the order for it. We will ship the battery right to their IT department, right to them. Or if you guys want to do it, we'll ship it right to you. It comes with instructions. You place the depleted battery once you do the swap. You put it into a, a battery, a package that's uh, proper for that, and it has return shipment on it. Just get it to a, a FedEx facility, or FedEx will come pick it up, and we'll take care of it and dispose of it properly. Because you don't want to take batteries like these, and obviously you don't want to throw them into uh, uh, the dumpster or throw them into their their trash was, you know, receptacle as you're swapping out batteries for them. They're very, very toxic when they start to um, break down. So the thing is with this, this is a huge opportunity. Again, I, I mentioned to you at the very beginning of this that I travel around a lot, which I, that's true, I do. I'm on the road about 75% of my life. I ask another question. So remember I asked at the beginning, how do you pick a UPS? Well, we get through all that. And then I ask them, well, how often do you swap batteries for your customers? It is very sad to hear that most of them never follow up to swap the batteries. So after, even on the best UPS units, after four or five years, <clears throat> the battery is either very depleted or it's dead, which means for the most part, you have a very expensive place to plug in your equipment and you really don't have battery backup. It is a free, returning revenue opportunity if you sell UPS units to go back. Now at the beginning, you still, you know, you're know you behind the game a little bit. You got two or three years before you're gonna start replacing the first one. Um, but we've sold over 10,000 premium UPS units since around before, slightly before 2014. So we know that around now or the next year after that, all those customers that bought those from us could be knocking on some doors saying, you need to buy a $543 item that I have to do absolutely zero work for. All I do is call them up and say, hey, it's probably time to change your battery. And then some of this thing, you know, gets shipped to them. The box is there. Or you can charge them whatever you charge to go out there and swap the battery for them. And then, you know, we automatically ship it back. So I, I've been preaching this. I don't know how successful I've been, but it is, it's a great way to pick up a few thousand dollars in sales every year for doing nothing more than selling the thing you need to sell them in the first place. And there's hardly any other component that you're, you're gonna put into somebody's system where you're gonna be able to come back four years later and say, I can guarantee you, you need to update some part of this system and it's the battery. Because they may go, eh, it's on our budget now. The battery will be, because again, we're back to the mission critical stuff. That's really it. Any questions before we move on? All right, good. So, um, are you guys in a hurry? Does everybody need to, to rush back to anything? Okay. So, I also wanted to talk about um, these IP based power products, which is kind of uh, some of which we brought here. And last time I was here, I did do a demo of our, so we have, a, if you notice on the UPS series, I said select, premium, and online. So <laughs> it's kind of the same on power. We have a select series uh, for IP power, and then we have a premium series, and then there's a, um, it's, not called, it's not called online, because that refers only to UPS, uh, but it's called series uh, protection. We're not gonna get into that too, too much right now, but I did want you guys to be aware again of the fact that we have this select series. And the select series came about from, the, from our customers, really listening to our customers who said, well, I like some of the, all the stuff that you show me with your premium series and your really expensive stuff, but really all I need is the ability to get online 
and be able to either one, see if the outlets are on or off, two, uh, set up some uh, what are called if-then statements, meaning um, that if we set up uh, for one of these outlets, the, the highlighted outlets here, the white ones, are the ones that are IP controlled. So if-then means if I sort of ping a, uh, an IP address, whether it's Google or some other piece of equipment in the system, and it comes back that it's not responsive or not active, what do I want this outlet to do? So our customer said, I want, I want to be able to do that on multiple outlets. So any, now all of these that are highlighted, we can do that on, on all of these. I want the interface to be really, really stupid simple so that I don't have to have a level three tech to go out there to set this up. So we listen to them on that front too. This is the interface in this. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get it up on the, the screen, but the interface for this thing is like dumb, dumb, simple. So um, again, if you have a minute, I can show you what this interface looks like. This series is very affordable and there's only about nine SKUs in the whole thing. So again, there's all the way from compact this size, like so. There's a little version like this that has uh, ethernet on this side and it has two outlets. So again, this would be like say the back of a, a TV or back of a flat panel with maybe, uh, you have another device back there that you need to flip on and off and you can monitor these two outlets. And then there's the biggest one would be, there's a larger version of this vertical power strip. So for a tall rack, you have um, up to 16 outlets on, on it. Now they're not all IP controlled, but there is a total of 16. So if you guys have a sec, then I'm going to see if my mouse will actually work, which apparently it's not. been able to do I had to figure out how to get this on the other screen hmm. Are you guys really experts on the uh, multi-screen? How to get one like this to go back up to the no? Okay. A four? Yeah, so I had the other display, the other the PowerPoint is on the uh, when it's on the, the split screen. This won't isn't showing up on the uh, won't automatically pop up on the other screen. But anyways, if you guys come up here I'll show you. I'm assuming we're not streaming this any longer. I think it's still live. Yeah. Oh, is it still live? Yeah. yeah All right. Freaking. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Kendall's got it. Oh, yay! <laughs> Woo! All right. Now, we'll that wouldn't have worked. This failed, but <laughs> since it did. <laughs> so, just to give you an idea of how easy this thing is, I'm, I'm actually connected to this unit right here with the three pretty bulbs on it. Um, so, up in the top right, you have your basic menu that uh, looks like just about, and you can set here your, your date and time. You can set the device settings, so if you wanted to, if you had many of these out in the field and wanted to, Paco rules power. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so we know, who's, we know whose power strip this is, I guess. Yeah. But anyways, you could do the same thing, and then if they have an account number, an internal account number, you can you know, put that in, and then you can describe it. So let's say the device name is Paco's rules power. Okay, great. But then he, Paco maybe has 10 of these things, and then I want to describe each one of them maybe differently so I know, you know where the heck they are, or I want to put the location in on top of the description. Um, and then you just, again, it's simple questions like initial outlet state. So what does that mean? It means when I first plug it in, you know, what happens? So again, it's just a matter of save. It's kind of like power for dummies that says, hey, you did it right. It actually worked. <laughs> Um, our old units are much more sophisticated in some ways, but they don't uh, give you all the stuff. So firmware update, the network, passwords, all that stuff you can set up over there. So we're going to not get into every single piece of minutia here. This would be if you manually wanted to initiate a sequence up or down. So one of the things is it's also a sequencer. So these outlets have numbers on them, as we see here. 
And in, in the simplest sense, it could just be a sequencer. So I want to turn it off and on, and I want things to come on in a certain order. And if I do that manually, let's say I want to bring it up, then I can set over here what the delay is I want when I go ahead and do that sequence. So let's just say I was going to initiate it. Like magic, my computer talks to the power. Or I want to, again, this is only if you're doing it manually. So let's say that for whatever reason somebody was on the job site and was like something was frozen. And we hadn't set up an if-then statement that, that, you know, for that particular application. I can go ahead and initiate a sequence right over the internet. So again, on the outlet control, it, you know, again, try to make this very easy to understand. What do I want to do here? I want to show all outlets, show in sequence outlets, so on and so forth. I usually only show controlled outlets because the other ones, what, what do I care? But if I bring these up, even the other ones, Paco's router, nice. So again, I can rename this outlet. So I remember when I go online, I want to know what's plugged into it. So I just plug that into it. Do I want it to be included in the sequence or not? Again, it's all sort of self-explanatory. And then if I want to, remember you're talking about the um, uh, if-then stuff? So I want to enable auto-ping. So if I say yes, I want to enable auto-ping. Does everybody understand what auto-ping is? No. I'll explain auto-ping. Auto-ping means that uh, from this device, I can send out a ping or a search, essentially, to an IP address. You know, if I was, if for example, it could be another piece of equipment that is on the ethernet uh, or on the LAN inside of the uh, system. Or it could be as something as simple as I'm going to ping Google to see if the router still works, if my router in the system is still working, to see if I actually have internet. So it could be whatever you want it to be. But let's just say we picked, we picked Google because we have our router in there, and I want to make sure that if the router crashes or the modem crashes or freezes up, not that that ever happens, because that really <laughs> never happens, um, that we would be able to do something what I call self-healing. In other words, I don't want, as easy as those things are to solve, and that phone call is to solve, okay, okay, go in there and plug this in, you know, did it and do it in this order, it takes 15 minutes, they're up, they're going, whew, easy. Me, I'd rather not have that phone call and rather not have to do that. So what I'll do is set up this and say, okay, well, if it, if it comes back and it pings and it, there's no response, what do I want to do? I want to power the outlet off, do I want to power off pending recovery, power on, so on and so forth? So most of the time you're going to power cycle until recovery. That would, that would be the most common thing. Or power cycle once. And then on the back end of this, you can send out email notifications too. So you can send out up to five emails w w triggered by this doing whatever you s set up here. That's cool. So it will tell me here Again, this, this was direct feedback from our installer. So you notice I tried to do something here that it says I can't do. So again, it explains to me step by step what's the deal or where, where I made a mistake. And it won't let me make a mistake. That's why I say you don't have to have your top IT guy out there like, yeah. It could be somebody you know that just if, that can be trained to just follow the step by step um, instructions and go through that way. So on the bottom, on the very bottom of it, is your status log, and the status log will keep track of uh, you know any time you've looked at it or any time something's happened. So it'll tell you these little snapshots of the of so the. Does that automatically update? Uh huh. It will automatically update. But it only really updates when something either happens or you're looking at it or you're opening up and doing something. It's right. not like constantly, I mean, if there's nothing to report, it really doesn't do much of a, much updating. Um, and it tells you here the last time, whatever it was, six, whatever, the, the, and nobody set the date and time in here, but you get the idea that um, at this particular date and time, that this was the status of, of everything that was on there. So again, this is a nice little snapshot if, if the customer, let's say your customer had called and said, hey, the thing's working the way you set it up, but for some reason, it's reset like five times today already. 
So you could log in, go to that bottom part, kind of see what was going on, and see which of the outlets were the ones that were restarting and restopping, and what, was, what had been happening. And then again, it helps you to be able to troubleshoot you know, maybe the router's going bad or maybe the modem's going bad or something. So um, I absolutely positively know this works because when, I, when this first came on the market, I quickly uh, installed one at my home because when I'm gone on the road 75% of the time, there's this device called Apple TV that is very popular in my house. <laughs> and the beauty of the Apple TV is it works 100% of the time. It never has any issues whatsoever. <laughs> it's golden. It's golden, except for when it locks up and freezes, which it does about once every two weeks or three weeks. And then I would get a call of, you know, I can't watch Netflix. And just like you remember, you were telling me. <laughs> My wife called me like last <laughs> week. She's like, it's down. Yeah, so. That's probably you know, her, right? Yeah, so that's it. Netflix down. is down. <laughs> Netflix is down. So I set this up at home so it would ping the IP address that the uh, Apple TV was on. And if the Apple TV didn't respond, it automatically restarted. Never had another phone call. Nice. That's awesome. Now, and I could go into the logs and see that I knew it restarted a few times. I mean, I, I knew that it had, or I knew that it was. Um, same with TiVo. I love TiVo, but again, um, on the very simple level, um, it freezes up every once in a while. It's very rare, but every once in a while, because uh, it operates off of the uh, off the LAN and the Ethernet, uh, it, it freezes up, and I have it do that same thing. No more problems. So again, imagine the same thing for your customers on a much bigger scale, on a commercial scale you do the same kind of a setup for them um, and have this thing do as much self-healing as possible. So that's really all I've got for right now. Thank you very, very much for, for sitting through this and thank you for the sitting through the refresher course. I very much appreciate it. And if you guys, do you have any qu other questions or anything else? So if that PowerShip can do all of that, how much does that uh, start at? Uh, Paco will be able to, you guys have the pricing on all this, all this stuff in your system. Right. Um, I don't know re retail and distributor prices off the top of, uh, the top of my head. Um, this, you know, I, this unit I get asked a lot and it's less than $300. So it's pretty, it's, it's pretty affordable. Retail, again, I don't. Right, right. This is, uh, the other thing that's kind of cool about this is that it, um, if our vertical power strips, I know you guys have sold them. You guys have used them. So uh, it's not much, this isn't much thicker than that. If you look at a lot of competing units, they're either very big and bulky, or there's a big blob, you know, the head, the brains of it are, you know, on the back, and it, it sticks out of the back of the rack. So this looks very much like our normal vertical power strip. And so there's this, a bigger version of this. There's a little baby unit. There's a full-size unit that, that might be it right there, as a matter of fact. Nope. That's a UPS, but it looks similar to that, about that form factor. And then there's a half rack piece, which would be like this, this width. And it comes with a year, so I mean, if you need to right. put in a full rack, you can do that. Or mount it on its side. Sometimes people can do that, so. Are you all, you're, so you're all in um, inside sales, or some of you in, in uh, do outside stuff as well? Outside. Work, yeah. You're outside, okay. I'm in the web department, that's uh, right. You're yes, the guy in the cave. Hole. You told me you're yeah. in the cave. <laughs> there in the hole. Yes, I got it's, it. It's very important. Hole. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Barely see light. Get the big as well as okay. Just in case I wanted to talk. Anyway, you say it don't spray. Oh, you know. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you. They did a very nice job designing that too. Really sweet with it. Right. Looks very nice. I like it. And Paco, all right. Paco rules Paco. the power. Yeah, all right. We'll see. See about that. <laughs>